and you've been upset by the fact that that is. Hello from Jonathan and from me. Welcome to a new week on Anglia Tonight. Well, first, it's been described as an act of pure evil, an act that's put brutal killer Stephen Marshall behind bars for life. The court heard salesman Geoffrey Howe considered Marshall to be his friend, but it was a friendship Marshall repaid by killing him and scattering his body parts across two counties before stealing his identity and possessions. Well, today at St Albans Crown Court, he was sentenced to a minimum of 36 years in prison. Neil Bradford is in court and joins us now. Neil. Yes, to his friends, Stephen Marshall was a lovable rogue who spent thousands of pounds on prostitutes and drugs, but he would also help them in a crisis. But a picture emerged in court of a highly volatile man, a man who could be charming and affable one minute, violent and dangerous the next. The police described him as arrogant, a man capable of such a horrific act for just such a small amount of personal gain. Are you surprised to learn that Jeffrey Howe's been murdered? No How did you feel when you found that he'd been murdered? No comment. In life and after death, Stephen Marshall betrayed his friend and colleague, Geoffrey Howe. From the very outset, he showed no emotion or remorse. During hours of police interviews, he simply replied, no comment, denying the murder until the evidence against him was overwhelming. A very dangerous, callous man. Um, quite clearly, Mr Howe was his friend. Mr Howe allowed him to stay at his address. Um, that uh, trust was abused uh, in the worst possible way by Stephen Marshall, an extremely dangerous man who now will spend the vast majority of his adult life behind bars. Marshall murdered kitchen salesman Geoffrey Howe on the night of the 8th and 9th of March last year. He stabbed him twice with a carving knife before returning to bed and leaving him to die. He then skillfully dismembered his body before disposing of it across two counties. The discovery of Geoffrey Howe's left leg beside the A507 at Cotterhead in Hertfordshire on March the 22nd last year sparked one of the most gruesome murder inquiries detectives in Hertfordshire have ever launched. In the weeks that followed, more of Mr Howe's remains were found across the county. His head was found in a field at Asfordby in Leicestershire. During the trial, the court heard that Marshall had boasted to friends that he was somewhat of an expert in disposing of bodies. Today came the startling omission that Geoffrey Howe wasn't the first body he'd dismembered. Through his defence counsel, Marshall admitted that he was involved in the dismemberment of at least four bodies when he was a nightclub bouncer between 1995 and 1998. The murder of Geoffrey Howe, though, was not a gangland execution. The simple motivation was greed. Marshall had been living rent-free at Geoffrey Howe's North London flat with his partner and co-accused Sarah Bush. He had hatched a plan to murder his colleague, to steal his identity and sell his possessions. Within hours of his murder, the couple sold his car on eBay and began to spend using his credit cards. For her part in the crime, 21-year-old Sarah Bush was jailed for three years and nine months. She pleaded guilty to misleading the police during a missing persons inquiry and helping dispose of Geoffrey Howe's body. She was photographed in the passenger seat of Marshall's car on the day it's thought Mr Howe's head was disposed of. Quite clearly we've heard throughout the uh, course of the trial, uh, Bush is a lot younger in age. Bush is a... Uh individual that can be influenced quite easily, uh, was quite clearly under the spell of Marshall, but she still has to take some uh, accountability for her own actions. Geoffrey Howe would have been 50 today, an occasion his family will never be able to celebrate. It will perhaps be little consolation to them that his murderer will spend his next 36 birthdays behind bars. Neil, back to you. Was there any reaction from Geoffrey Howe's family today? Yes, in a statement issued through police, the family said that no prison sentence would ever be long enough for what they'd done. They went on to say that no mother should ever have to contemplate her son being treated in such an inhumane manner. It's something which we will never be able to comprehend, they said. They described Geoffrey as jovial, charming, with a heart of gold, who will be sadly missed. Their biggest regret, they say, is not being able to say goodbye. Now, with the admission that Stephen Marshall dismembered more bodies, that, of course, will open up new lines for detectives to investigate. But detectives are really hoping that it may provoke a confession from Stephen Marshall as to what he's done with Geoffrey Howe's hands, the only part of his body that is still missing. 
We'll see about that. Thank you very much indeed, Neil Bradford. Right, uh, next tonight, concerns have been raised about the standard of nursing care at one of our region's hospitals. Patients have complained that nurses at Hinchingbrook Hospital near Huntingdon haven't been taking proper care of the elderly. The hospital's promised to investigate. Stuart Lees has this report. She's a full-time carer, and Tish Dolan from St Ives is not happy about the way nurses cared for her mother, Pat, when the 69-year-old was an inpatient at Hinchingbrook Hospital near Huntingdon back in September. I've seen them at desks reading, uh, take a break and playing around with their, their mobile phones, sending texts whatever, when clearly you can hear call buttons being press, pressed all over the place, but they're, they're just not responding. Pat can't remember much about her recent stay in hospital, but she was able to give me a sense of what was going on around her. Fortunately, I could do a lot for myself, but I also saw what was happening all around me, and it's scary. It really scares you. And uh, I spent most of my time trying to put flag up and saying, we need help here, you know. In a statement, the hospital has said that it takes all complaints seriously and that they will be trying to contact the Dolan family directly. They say they treat more than 30,000 inpatients each year and that most are satisfied with the care and treatment they receive. But they add that they are sorry if and when a patient feels the treatment they've received has not reached the standard that they expected. Janet Halsall is another former Hinchingbrook patient with concerns about the care on offer. The grandmother of seven, who was having tests at the hospital last month, then turned her attention to other patients, performing what she calls proper nursing duties. One lady had been asking if she could go to the toilet and have a wash before breakfast, and at ten to nine I couldn't stand it any longer, so I found a bowl and I washed her from head to toe, and she was just so grateful. The hospital has said it is also investigating Mrs Halsall's complaints. I think what I can say is that where people have talked about the things that would um, improve services in hospital, they talk about what I would call very basic things. So things, around, things that are about protecting um, and promoting dignity and respect. So um, being able to have assistance with eating and drinking if that's required, being able to keep uh, clean and comfortable and have clean clothes, and assistance to go to the bathroom actually when we need it. So very, very basic human needs. Hinchingbrook says it has procedures in place for patients to air their concerns, but Tish Dolan says her mum won't be staying in the hospital again. Stuart Leiths, Anglia News. The Cambridgeshire inquest, which has put the regions out of our medical care under intense scrutiny, is now drawing to a close. After three weeks, the coroner has retired to consider the evidence into the death of David Gray from Maney, who died after being given an accidental overdose by German locum Dr Daniel Ubani. His recommendations later this week are likely to have strong repercussions on the future employment of foreign doctors, as Matthew Hudson reports. Cambridgeshire coroner William Morris has a lot to consider. After an inquest lasting three weeks, he must now compile a report into the circumstances surrounding the death of David Gray. But when this inquest reconvenes at 10 o'clock on Thursday, the coroner won't simply bring in a verdict of, for instance, accidental death or misadventure. He'll present what's called a narrative verdict, and in that narrative verdict he can't apportion blame to individuals or organisations, but what he can do is present recommendations to try and prevent tragedies happening again in the future. And everyone agrees Mr Gray's death was a tragedy. In February 2008, he was given a massive, lethal dose of diamorphine at his home in Maney. It was administered by Dr Daniel Ubani, a German doctor with poor English. He'd arrived in this country just hours earlier to begin his first out-of-hours shift on behalf of the healthcare provider Take Care Now. The case has shone an intense spotlight on out-of-hours care. I'm on the outskirts of Thetford. Here in Norfolk, there are four doctors on call at weekends, covering a population of 740,000. 
A few yards away over the border in Suffolk, it's just two doctors covering a population of 600,000 people. This is now a major issue, which all opposition parties are likely to seize on in the run-up to a general election. In the shorter term, all eyes will be on Wisbeach Magistrates Court on Thursday when Mr Morris delivers his recommendations. Matthew Hudson, Anglian News, Wisbeach Magistrates Court. Those recommendations, of course, here on Angley tonight. Right. It's